Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. The rain lashed against the windshield with such ferocity that Tom couldn't help but flinch with each impact. It's pounding so hard, they'll break the hour hand and the glass, he commented grimly. This scene of natural madness was complemented by an inner tension that had been accumulating for three long months. Tom was desperate to break free from the grip of stress, but he didn't know which approach would yield the best results in this situation. A generous serving of strong spirits or an escape to some secluded place. Intuition guided him to the right choice. Tom, while you're searching for that place, your sanity will completely crumble. So, now is the perfect time to drink until oblivion. After all, scientists claim that many brilliant thoughts occur to a person in a questionable state. The head of Peterson's Cosmetics was accustomed to listening to his inner voice. Trying to ignore the celestial deluge as much as possible, he started the car and pulled out of the parking lot. His alter ego was content with the decision he had made. In weather like this only vodka will do, the man sadly smirked to his thoughts and mumbled, and a great reason has presented itself. Or rather, you can't think of anything worse. For Tom Peterson, it seemed that fate was mocking him once again, just like it had throughout the day. One misfortune followed another, and he couldn't dodge these blows. The thought crossed his mind again. It's as if someone has purposely sent a curse upon me. He immediately dismissed that notion, as he didn't believe in superstitious nonsense, but he couldn't explain the string of failures in his business either. He had no one to consult about this. So, the businessman decided that there was nothing better to do than to drink. Initially, he had thoughts about his first wife's grandmother causing this. People said all sorts of things about her. But then he found out she had passed away and scolded himself. How can anyone believe in such damn nonsense? Well, this is something else. It's more like a streak that's been drawn out for far too long. It must end eventually. That's usually how it goes. Peterson had never been one to overindulge in strong spirits, but he knew they helped clear the mind of unnecessary clutter. He moved slowly through the street, trying to discern familiar landmarks through the curtain of rain. Finally, a sign for a beer bar with a promising name, Cheerful Carp, came into view. The logo of the establishment not only contained the textual part but also featured an image of a huge fish with a radiant smile. When Tom graced the bar with his presence for the first time, he asked the administrator. Probably those who came up with such an amazing advertisement featuring the fish, they must have taken a substantial dose themselves. The puzzled administrator asked the customer. Why would you think that? Tom blurted out without thinking about the consequences. Well, because a sober person wouldn't come up with the idea to depict a fish of an unknown breed with a smile on its face. The lanky man looked at the esteemed visitor with offense and corrected him. Fish don't have faces, they have muzzles. That's what biologists decided to call that part. Peterson didn't like being corrected. He decided to flaunt his knowledge as well. Ichthyologists, if we're digging so deep. These specialists are the ones who study fish. The administrator couldn't argue because it wasn't in his interest to deter customers. After that incident, Tom stopped by the bar a few more times, where they incidentally served very high-quality beer. Today, he decided to drop by for an hour as well. The parking lot was about a hundred meters from the bar, and he had to cover this distance in pouring rain. Since he had forgotten to bring an umbrella, his suit got soaked through in less than a minute. Out of habit, Tom looked up to show his respect to the establishment's owner. Hello to you. The master of the carps. But this time, the usually cheerful fish greeted him with a sinister grin. Tom shuddered, the rain lashed against the windshield with such ferocity that Tom couldn't help but flinch with each impact. It's pounding so hard, they'll break the hour hand and the glass, he commented grimly. This scene of natural madness was complemented by an inner tension that had been accumulating for three long months. Tom was desperate to break free from the grip of stress, but he didn't know which approach would yield the best results in this situation. A generous serving of strong spirits or an escape to some secluded place. Intuition guided him to the right choice. 
Tom, while you're searching for that place, your sanity will completely crumble. So, now is the perfect time to drink until oblivion. After all, scientists claim that many brilliant thoughts occur to a person in a questionable state. The head of Peterson's Cosmetics was accustomed to listening to his inner voice. Trying to ignore the celestial deluge as much as possible, he started the car and pulled out of the parking lot. His alter ego was content with the decision he had made. In weather like this only vodka will do, the man sadly smirked to his thoughts and mumbled, and a great reason has presented itself. Or rather, you can't think of anything worse. For Tom Peterson, it seemed that fate was mocking him once again, just like it had throughout the day. One misfortune followed another, and he couldn't dodge these blows. The thought crossed his mind again. It's as if someone has purposely sent a curse upon me. He immediately dismissed that notion, as he didn't believe in superstitious nonsense, but he couldn't explain the string of failures in his business either. He had no one to consult about this. So, the businessman decided that there was nothing better to do than to drink. Initially, he had thoughts about his first wife's grandmother causing this. People said all sorts of things about her. But then he found out she had passed away and scolded himself. How can anyone believe in such damn nonsense? Well, this is something else. It's more like a streak that's been drawn out for far too long. It must end eventually. That's usually how it goes. Peterson had never been one to overindulge in strong spirits, but he knew they helped clear the mind of unnecessary clutter. He moved slowly through the street, trying to discern familiar landmarks through the curtain of rain. Finally, a sign for a beer bar with a promising name, Cheerful Carp, came into view. The logo of the establishment not only contained the textual part, but also featured an image of a huge fish with a radiant smile. When Tom graced the bar with his presence for the first time, he asked the administrator. Probably those who came up with such an amazing advertisement featuring the fish, they must have taken a substantial dose themselves. The puzzled administrator asked the customer. Why would you think that? Tom blurted out without thinking about the consequences. Well, because a sober person wouldn't come up with the idea to depict a fish of an unknown breed with a smile on its face. The lanky man looked at the esteemed visitor with offense and corrected him. Fish don't have faces, they have muzzles. That's what biologists decided to call that part. Peterson didn't like being corrected. He decided to flaunt his knowledge as well. Ichthyologists, if we're digging so deep. These specialists are the ones who study fish. The administrator couldn't argue because it wasn't in his interest to deter customers. After that incident, Tom stopped by the bar a few more times, where they incidentally served very high-quality beer. Today, he decided to drop by for an hour as well. The parking lot was about a hundred meters from the bar, and he had to cover this distance in pouring rain. Since he had forgotten to bring an umbrella, his suit got soaked through in less than a minute. Out of habit, Tom looked up to show his respect to the establishment's owner. Hello to you. The master of the carps. But this time, the usually cheerful fish greeted him with a sinister grin. Tom shuddered and quickly averted his gaze. I definitely need to get very drunk. Otherwise, I'll lose it with everyone. He descended the stairs where he was met by the familiar administrator with his usual smile. Mr. Peterson. What an unexpected surprise. All the visitors called the administrator Steve and he began bustling around the customer. This customer, of course, wasn't the best in terms of character, but he always gave good tips. For money, Steve was ready to bend over backward. Money doesn't have a smell at all. It doesn't matter how they come about. The main thing is to have them. And if he could smile one more time, bend a little, express himself in a way that pleases the customer, he could do that. Yes, you're soaked to the bone. Let's take your jacket. We'll dry it up in a jiffy. Tom took off the upper part of his suit. Thank you, Steve. It's always pleasant to visit you. And in such bad weather, it feels like home here. Flattered by the praise, the administrator withdrew, but reappeared a couple of minutes later. He was prepared to offer the regular bar patron a couple of new menu items, but Peterson made a dismissive gesture. 
Steve, I'm not in the mood for formalities today. I'm ready to tear everyone apart, so for me, it's better to restore my mental balance by taking a classic chaser. The administrator cleared his throat. I understand. I'll send a waiter right away, followed by the same casual gesture. No need for extra fuss. Be a friend and bring me a double portion yourself. Of course, if that's not too burdensome for you. The administrator's eyes widened, and at that moment, he resembled the carp depicted above the entrance. No, it's not difficult for me, in fact, it's even a pleasure to fulfill the request of our loyal customer. But, Mr. Peterson, as I've noticed, you're the one behind the wheel. Tom slapped the man on the shoulder. So it turns out you're even spying on customers from your basement, huh? Admirable. But don't worry about me, Steve. I never get behind the wheel when I'm not sober. If I'm completely wasted, will you call me a taxi? Steve puffed his sunken chest out. Of course, Mr. Peterson. Any of your wishes. The administrator disappeared again behind the partition separating the kitchen area from the hall and soon returned with a tray, on which sat a majestic glass of nearly a liter's capacity. With a solemn look he declared. Our signature, straight from the fridge. Squinting his eyes, Tom took a large sip. Amazing taste. The administrator departed with a satisfied smile, and Peterson took another substantial gulp. For a few minutes, he sat with his eyes closed, savoring the pleasant sensation that quickly spread throughout his body. He physically felt his anxiety loosening its grip, and his awareness was clearing with each passing second. An invisible voice within him spoke distinctly. Tom, could the causes of your troubles be within your surroundings? Have you forgotten that even the closest people can betray you? Over the last few years, you've become incredibly confident, and that's extremely dangerous for your business. Peterson focused on that inner voice and didn't notice the stocky man with a looming bald spot approaching his table. May I? Tom emerged from the pleasant state of weightlessness and involuntarily looked at the stranger. I'm sorry, what did you say? The sturdy man wasn't embarrassed. I thought you wouldn't mind if I land at your table? The weather outside is dreadful, while it's dry and quiet here. Tom wanted to tell the intruder that there were plenty of empty tables in the hall, but the man beat him to it. I noticed you right away, Mr. Peterson. You were sitting with such an expression on your face, as if you were sent into space without your consent. And you decided to join the crew too? Not exactly like that. I just felt like providing a little backup for you. The man took a beer mug from the waiter and then meticulously wiped his hands with a napkin. Only after that did he introduce himself properly. Mr. Leo. Lawyer. Peterson shook the extended hand but didn't say anything. Mr. Leo interpreted this silence as a sign of approval and continued. Actually, I'm a corporate lawyer. I could be of use to you. Peterson stared piercingly into the self-satisfied face of his interlocutor. How much? Mr. Leo emptied his glass and then picked up the napkin again. I believe we can come to an agreement on the price. This lawyer appearing out of nowhere was starting to irritate Tom. Mr. Leo, be honest. Who sent you? Do you really think I'm so naive that I'd believe the tale that you just happened to be in this bar? Especially in this weather? Mr. Leo let out an annoyed chuckle. You'd make a great investigator, not the CEO of a cosmetics company. You scanned me through and through. Now there's no escaping it. But you're right. I won't deny that I didn't end up here by accident. The thing is, your wife, Ms. Martha, asked me for help. I've already studied your problem, and I want to say. Peterson cut the lawyer off abruptly. For a considerable fee, I could make up anything. Mr. Leo, I'm not a novice in business, and I understand perfectly well that my situation has virtually no positive outcome. The lawyer shifted in his chair. But hope dies last. If. Mr. Mr. Leo. I won't throw money into a hopeless adventure. Especially since the company is stuck in a rut right now. But Tom. The businessman stood up, signaling that the conversation was over. 
If I need your help, I'll definitely find you. All the best to you. Peterson walked past the stretched thin administrator without leaving him a tip. Negative emotions overwhelmed the businessman once again. At the exit, he remembered his jacket and returned to the hall. Steve silently handed him the dried piece of clothing and received a monetary bonus for his attentiveness. The maitre d' hotel bid farewell, and with a practiced magician's move, he slipped the bill into his pocket. Mr. Peterson. Should I call a taxi for you? Tom grumbled dissatisfiedly. No need. I'll manage in my car. Steve didn't say anything and glanced at the table where an almost full glass sat. The chance acquaintance of the cosmetics company owner also disappeared quietly, leaving a few small denomination banknotes on the table. The celestial revelry was gradually subsiding, and only a light drizzle monotonously tapped on the pavement. Tom's mood continued to plummet, and he no longer attempted to restrain himself. When Kevin rushed into the hallway and threw himself onto his neck, he roughly extricated himself from his son's embrace. Kevin. You nearly knocked me over. Look, Dad is tired. The eight-year-old little one muttered discontentedly. Dad. You need to go to the hospital so a doctor can check you. You're always angry and tired, but I wanted to have a serious talk with you. The man tried to rectify his mistake. Son, we'll definitely talk, but just a bit later. And where's mom? Kevin wordlessly waved his hand toward the kitchen and lowered his head, a sign of extreme offense, heading to his room. The head of the household headed in the indicated direction, and the pressure gauge of tension reached its maximum when Martha, with a smile, said. You're home so early today, and I'm still busy with dinner. There was nothing provocative in the woman's tone, but Tom got angry. Tisk tisk. How sweetly we chirp. Like a caring little bird. Your concern, Martha, is already getting on my nerves. Why did you send that idiot to me? Tears glistened in the woman's eyes, but her voice remained steady. Why are you jumping on me right from the doorstep? Explain everything like a civilized person. What happened? The calmness in his wife's demeanor added fuel to the fire of the escalating family dispute. Don't pretend to be an innocent lamb. Why did you send that dim-witted lawyer to me? Miss Martha assumed a defensive position, and the spatula in her hand looked like a symbol of female determination. If you haven't forgotten, dear I also work in the company you lead. So, I have every right to make decisions to save our common creation. The man even jumped in place. Our common? Did I miss here? Since when did Peterson Cosmetics become your property? Clearly, the woman didn't anticipate such a vehement reaction. She started gulping air nervously. But I'm your wife. Therefore, I have the right. Tom cut her off mid-sentence. That means nothing. I must tell you that your status gives you absolutely no advantage. You're nothing. Zero. I and only I can make decisions. Of course, as a member of the board of directors, you can present your suggestions. But you understand that it's a conditional structure, because I have the final say. Emptying all his accumulated irritation onto his wife, Tom spoke calmly now. And in the future, I kindly ask you. Don't stick your nose where it's not wanted. It was said so rudely that Martha couldn't hold back her tears anymore. She cried and shouted. Fine. I won't say another word, but I want to remind you, Tom. That once, as you consider it, your company was saved thanks to my intervention. It's a shame you have such a short memory. Tom had never seen Martha in such a distraught state before. Some distant chord resonated in his heart, and he approached his wife, attempting to embrace her, but Martha pushed him away. Do not touch me. You only think about yourself and your ambitions, and you couldn't care less about anyone else. I heard stories about how you mistreated Laura, your first wife, and I, naive as I was, believed only your side of the story. I thought people were spreading rumors about you out of envy. Now I understand that you were the stumbling block all along. Tom listened to his wife, unable to say anything against it, because in her desperate monologue, he heard the answer to a long lingering question. What were the reasons for his chronic failures? 
Meanwhile, the woman continued, now more calmly. You, Tom, are used to giving orders, but you always pass the responsibility onto others' shoulders. That's exactly what happened when you got involved with scammers last year, who supplied us with substandard substance, and the entire batch was defective. If you haven't forgotten, it resulted in multi-million dollar losses. One would think a reasonable person would learn from such a serious mistake, but you jumped into a new adventure. You never think about anyone other than yourself. You don't care about the people who will be left out on the streets if the company goes bankrupt. Tom clenched his fists and growled. Don't predict doom. I'm sure we'll come out of this. We just need to come up with something effective, but unconventional. The woman glared at him with anger in her eyes. Sure, you sit and think, while I wash my hands of it. I'm convinced that this time the company won't survive. Only a miracle can save it. That's why I turned to Mr. Leo. But since my intervention isn't welcome to you, I won't lift a finger. Ms. Martha, with her head held high, headed for the exit but paused at the door for a second. And don't you dare shout at me. Never. The man heard his wife intentionally call their son loudly and instructed him. Kevin, get ready. We're going to visit Grandma. And what about Dad? Dad needs to rest a little and calm his nerves. Soon, the front door slammed shut, leaving him alone with his gloomy thoughts. Arguments with his wife had occurred before, but over the past year and a half, they had become more frequent, which greatly irritated Tom. A similar situation had occurred in the final years of his previous marriage. Therefore, he couldn't understand what these women wanted from him and why they were always dissatisfied with everything. Contemplating this issue, the man prepared himself an omelette and had dinner without much appetite. He thought that Martha had become too bold, and it was time to rein her in. In this context, memories of his first wife, Laura, resurfaced in his mind, as he had once attempted a similar course of action with her. However, the always compliant woman, who used to hang on to his every word, unexpectedly expressed her disagreement. Of course, Tom couldn't forgive her for such an act of defiance. These memories triggered unpleasant thoughts, and Tom angrily threw his plate into the sink. He wanted to find solace in front of the TV, but the image of his first wife prevented him from focusing on the plot of an exciting action movie. What nonsense is this? Seems like a bad omen. It's all this cursed stress. The man returned to the kitchen and poured himself a full shot of vodka. The nervous feeling disappeared immediately, and to enhance the effect, Tom poured another half shot. The fiery liquid flowed through his veins, and, much like at the bar not long ago, he felt an incredible lightness. Home remedy is better than any pills. Tom said this with optimism and put the sweaty bottle back into the refrigerator. He returned to the TV and, without his previous irritation, began to flick through channels with the remote. The drink had relaxed his body so much that he didn't notice when he dozed off. Throughout the night, he dreamt of Laura. But this nocturnal vision evoked nostalgia for the irretrievably lost times when he had been truly happy. The persistent sound of the alarm clock made Tom open his eyes, but the feelings he had relived in his dream stayed with him all day. Suddenly, he had an overwhelming urge to talk to his father, and he even instinctively reached for the phone, only to pull his hand back immediately. What obsession is this? I must be out of my mind. After all, Dad died three years ago. Mr. George Peterson had become a widower at an early age and raised his only son himself. He was a well-known scientist in the field of plant genetics, but despite his high status, he preferred simplicity and modesty in everyday life. He also tried to instill an aesthetic way of life in his son from an early age. Tom, remember that relying on comforts and excess makes a person dependent. For a while, the boy adhered to these principles and even attempted to emulate his father. However, during his teenage years, everything changed, and he reminded his father at every opportunity. Dad, I don't want to consciously deprive myself of an interesting life. Small pleasures don't ruin a person, as you claim. They simply complement one's existence, and I don't want to deny myself that. Mr. George tried for a while to convince his son, but then he gave up. He didn't have the extra time to try and instill life-tested truths into his adolescent son. 
After all, the elder Peterson managed his scientific work and teaching his beloved subject. Professors often invited him to educational institutions in neighboring countries to give lectures, and he hardly ever declined such invitations. Tom tried many times to instill in his father the idea that such an intense work schedule was dangerous for his health. Mr. George, in his philosophical manner, would respond. My son, life itself is dangerous. So, I don't see the point in restricting myself. What's destined cannot be avoided anyway. So, father and son lived, each trying not to interfere with the other. But everything changed with the appearance of Laura. During one of his out-of-town lectures, Mr. George met a student who impressed him with her extensive knowledge of biology. Emotions welled up from the professor's heart, and since there was no one in the house except his son, he shared his joy with him. Tom. I couldn't even imagine that our land would produce such bright talents. You know, I recently gave a lecture at the academy and had the fortune to meet an amazing girl. Imagine, she outclassed me, the professor, in every sense of the word. For the sake of decency, Tom asked. Since you've mentioned her, tell me more. Who is she? The elder Peterson became animated. At first glance, she seems like just another girl. She's from a small district center, and she's been passionate about horticulture since childhood. Following her heart, she enrolled in the biotechnology department of the academy. After graduation, she plans to get into agribusiness. Tom couldn't hide his surprise. For a girl, that's certainly an unusual interest. But dad, you yourself know that in youth, everyone makes grand plans, and then. The professor interrupted his son. Don't judge everyone by yourself. You, good for nothing. I've already come to terms with that about you. But this girl, she's full of amazing ideas bursting forth like a fountain from her. The father's enthusiasm struck a painful chord in Tom's ego. It was difficult for the son to interject amidst his father's torrent of words. Dad, stop. You know that first impressions are often deceiving. The professor waved his hands in exasperation. No, my dear. My intuition has never failed me. There's definitely a business streak in this girl. She just needs to be directed toward a productive path. Father, you've intrigued me so much that I'm burning with the desire to meet her. You described her so vividly. The senior Peterson was flattered by the praise and immediately agreed. All right. I'll arrange a meeting for you. But, Tom, I warn you, no fancy tricks. Tom crossed his arms over his chest. Father. I promise to behave like a true gentleman. Back then, Tom couldn't have imagined that meeting a charming provincial girl would drastically change his life. Although the girl couldn't be called a beauty, she exuded an abundance of charm. Laura emitted so much energy that one day Tom playfully remarked. Laura, I bet we can charge phones and other electronics with you. The girl chuckled. You're not the first to make that observation. When I was very little, my grandfather used to tell his village friends that I was a robot with batteries. Your grandfather has a great sense of humor. Tom, you won't believe it, but people believed him. Of course, the locals interpreted the joke in their own way. They spread rumors that John's granddaughter doesn't have a real heart, just a little motor. They all pitted me and showered me with candies. It's a shame my grandfather is no longer with us, but we often visit the village. So, his house is never empty. Tom found this story amusing. I've never been to the countryside. Are people really that naive there? Yes, and no. They're just ordinary people, but a penchant for gossip is a necessary element to ward off boredom. Just a few days of interaction with Laura left an impression on Tom. Apart from her positive energy, the professor's favorite stood out for her sharp intellect. One day, she confessed to him. Tom. If I had a considerable amount of money, I would start a cosmetics company. The young man was surprised. But you don't know anything about that. Laura laughed. You're deeply mistaken because the basis of every cream, lotion, or shampoo is plant extracts. By the way, it's a profitable field. 
After all, half of humanity are women. Tom immediately got excited about the idea. Laura, there's something about your words. Tom struggled to find the right word, but he dismissed the minor details and moved on to the next point. By the way, many men are also not indifferent to the pursuit of beauty. Personally, your idea has intrigued me a lot. Tell me, how would you name your company? Because that's a crucial part of the brand. Laura smiled. Great things come from simple ideas. Unfortunately, my last name sounds funny, but yours could be the perfect foundation. Listen to how promising it sounds, Cosmetics by Peterson or Youthfulness by Peterson. That's just off the top of my head. Tom already imagined himself at a future presentation. This image inspired him so much that he enveloped the girl in his arms and spun her around in a dance. Laura, you're my fairy. A true magician. The boundless joy of the young man stemmed from the fact that he couldn't find his place in the world. After graduating from the Chemical Technology Institute, the professor's son had only worked in his field for a year. He didn't want to toil for the state from the beginning, and two attempts at starting his own business ended in complete failure. Meeting Laura breathed new hope into him, and he decided to keep her by his side. For the greater goal, he proposed to her. Although Laura understood perfectly well that the young man didn't harbor romantic feelings for her, she agreed to become his wife. Their union turned out to be successful both in life and business. However, their period of prosperity continued until the day Tom met Martha. Laura paled in comparison to the refined rival, who possessed perfect body proportions. After all, what irritated Tom most was his wife's weight. Even before marriage, Laura wasn't slim, and after the birth of their daughter Pamela, she gained more weight. Tom continuously humiliated his wife, openly comparing her to a well-known animal. Then, on an unpleasant autumn day, the loving husband informed her. Laura, I can't live with you anymore. Because I've met a woman with whom I'm not ashamed to appear in decent society. This confession came as a surprise to the young woman, and she didn't immediately grasp what had just happened. Tom, you made a bad joke. After all, I could take offense. Her husband responded sharply. I've long stopped caring about your offenses. You pretend to be something unknown, but you're just a country bumpkin. Let's not delve into the details, and let's just go our separate ways. But I can't do that, and I don't want to. I've invested everything in our company. Tom burst into laughter. You? It's my achievement and my money. If it weren't for me, your worthless ideas would have vanished due to lack of demand. At that time, Tom said a lot of nasty things to his wife, and in conclusion, he asked her to quickly clear the premises. Now, he recalled that action with horror. Unintentionally, he blurted out. Yeah, buddy. You acted like a complete jerk. What else can you call someone who kicked his wife and little daughter out the door? He wasn't surprised that, for the first time in ten years, he remembered his daughter. What troubled the businessman most was the fact that Martha, for whom he had kicked out his first wife, had sided with his ex-competitor today. The man murmured quietly. Hmm. Female solidarity is a powerful force. After thinking for a moment, he tossed a question into the void. I wonder where Laura is now. Probably somewhere in the village, struggling to find food? Tom was not wrong about one thing. His first wife did indeed settle in a small village. However, she wasn't struggling as Tom had thought, she was living and working there quite contentedly. On that evening at the end of summer, Laura was about to make oatmeal for two, as was her tradition. But she realized that there wasn't a pinch of salt in the house. Pamela sat at the table, waiting for breakfast, but from the perplexed expression on her mother's face, she understood that their morning meal was being postponed. Irritated, the girl pushed her spoon away. Mom, did we run out of something again? The woman smiled. You guessed it, sweetheart. And what is it this time? Salt, sugar, milk, cereal? Laura responded warmly, daughter, you got it right. Pamela listed off the gastronomic nominations and didn't even try to hide her displeasure. Laura guiltily mumbled. There's no salt. It was there yesterday, and today it's gone. 
I've been so absent-minded lately. Pamela sarcastically remarked. Maybe the mice ate all the salt. They love salt. They can't live without it. The girl abruptly stood up, and the chair toppled to the floor with a crash. Laura flinched. Pamela, could you please control your irritation? Nothing serious happened. The grocery store is just two minutes away on foot. You can run there and bring back some salt, and then we can. The 15-year-old egoist curled her lips disdainfully. And why should I? Mom, it's your oversight, so you should fix it. Everyone's gotten used to it. Pamela, run there. Pamela, bring this. Accompanying her disgruntled speech with gestures and facial expressions, the daughter prompted a burst of laughter from her mother. My girl. You're quite a character. You're the youngest in the family, so it's your duty to carry out such tasks. Pamela almost shouted. But I don't want. Maybe I have my own plans. A plaintive tone crept into the girl's voice, and Laura calmly remarked. All right. If running to the store is so difficult for you, I'll go myself. There's no need to throw a tantrum over such a trivial matter. Pamela pouted. Mommy. It's not because of me, it's your fault that there's a big fuss about the salt. Any normal housewife knows what food she has at home and what's running out. But you. Interrupting her daughter with laughter, the mother interjected. Well, maybe I'm not a normal housewife, but you're not a stranger here either. You could keep track of the groceries. Can't you see your mom is overwhelmed? I have so much to do that I can't catch my breath. Pamela stayed silent, furrowing her brows. Laura decided that this was the right moment for a bit of parenting. And besides, daughter. I don't like that you wander around idle all day. You could at least help me sometimes. I'm not asking too much from you. The girl grimaced again and cut off her mother. No, mommy. You won't lure me into that trap. I've had enough of your plantation. Pamela gestured toward her throat and for added effect, stuck her tongue out. And I'm not going to follow your example, mom. That means there's no continuity in our family. In other words, that option is completely off the table. The woman looked at her daughter affectionately. You look just like a wet little sparrow right now. Pamela glared at her with anger in her eyes. Thanks for not comparing me to a worm or a frog. But you can say whatever you want, I still won't change my attitude towards your business. The girl made air quotes with her fingers and headed towards the entrance, but her mother caught her hand. My dear daughter. You'll still be able to change your plans a hundred times. If, of course, you have any plans. I'm not going to force you. But as your mother, I have the right to know about your plans. Tell me, where do you want to direct your energy? The girl widened her eyes and elegantly spread her arms, as if trying to embrace the whole universe. Mom. I dream of becoming a model. You can't deny that I have all the qualifications for it, right? Both the face and the figure. Pamela glanced at her mother, but Laura responded to her heiress in an instructive tone. In addition to what you mentioned, it's also good to have some brains in your head. A model's professional life is very short. Ten years at most, and there's no guarantee that you'll make the cut. There are plenty of pretty girls out there. So, the modeling business is extremely competitive. Apparently, Laura's warning left Pamela puzzled. She concentrated for about a minute and then cheerfully said. Nonsense. If I don't make it as a model, I'll try acting. Even my teachers at school tell me that with my looks, I'm suited for either the stage or the catwalk. Laura let out a heavy sigh. Here we go again. You've filled your head with all sorts of nonsense. The girl exclaimed. Mom. Well, you don't want me to spend my whole life stuck in this village, do you? And what's wrong with our village? Yes, everyone. Everything here is dull, and the people are dull and gloomy. If I knew what people were saying about you, I would have left this place a long time ago. Laura chuckled. I know that people are constantly gossiping about me, but I haven't paid attention to it for a long time. 
And as for those people, Pamela. Let me tell you, you still need to grow and mature to reach their level. And overall, try not to use such expressions in my presence anymore. A blush crept onto the girl's cheeks, and she started to breathe more heavily. Laura decided to further tease her daughter. Why are you flaring your nostrils like a spirited filly? Don't like criticism? Get used to it. You won't encounter anything different in life. Pamela blurted out rapidly. You keep on nagging, 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 I'm so tired of it, and stormed out of the room. Laura straightened the chair her daughter had knocked over and wearily sat down on it. She's just like her father. Equally headstrong and self-assured. The woman rarely thought of her husband, who had effectively kicked her out of the house along with their little daughter. But lately, Pamela had been demonstrating the not-so-great sides of her character so frequently that the comparison to her father slipped off her tongue. Maybe she'll grow out of it? After all, I was rebellious at her age too, argued with my parents and grandfather, and then I settled down. Although, my life probably shouldn't serve as an example. And I don't want my daughter to have the same fate. I'll have to go for salt myself. I'll go to the plot in the afternoon, when the heat has died down a bit. Despite the tangible approach of autumn, the last days of August were tropical heat. Therefore Laura supplemented her modest closet with a stylish hat with huge brim. She barely glanced in the mirror and half-heartedly characterized her outfit. Of course, a chintz sundress and a hat is not quite a good combination, but for a trip to the village shop this outfit will do. The woman took with her a straw bag, with which she always went to the store and headed towards the outlet, but it was not long before she appeared on the main street. There were only five streets in the village, and there was a lot of activity in the yards along the main thoroughfare of the village. The first to notice the florist was Grandmother Amalia, who swarmed on her plot near the fence. The old woman straightened her back and ran to the gate. Oh, Laura. I didn't recognize you right away. I was wondering who that fancy lady in the hat was. Turns out it's you. Laura politely greeted the old woman and continued on her way, but getting away from Ms. Amalia wasn't that simple. This woman could sense a sensation from miles away, and now she galloped after Laura as well. Laura. Where are you rushing off to? The woman stopped. Ms. Amalia, I'm in a hurry to the store. Ms. Amalia brightened up. Wait. I'll walk you to the gate. I need to clarify something. I've been wanting to consult with you for a while. But the right opportunity never arose. I'm listening. Don't worry, I won't keep you for long. What I wanted to ask you is this. You're the only educated person in the whole village. You graduated from an academy. That means you know about herbs. In the village, it was customary to start an important conversation with a preamble. Ms. Amelia's introductory part turned out to be too long, and Laura didn't hide her impatience. Ms. Amalia, medicinal herbs and flowers are somewhat different concepts, but I'll be happy to help if I can. What did you want to ask me? Yes, yes. I'm interested in the flowers you grow. Tell me, is it true that they help with coughs? To quickly get rid of the persistent grandma, the farmer blurted out quickly. Lavender is beneficial for many ailments, but you'd better ask our doctors about that. I just know that for treating bronchitis, people take the roots and prepare them in a special way. And how? Don't you know? Although Laura knew several recipes for preparing medicinal remedies using lavender, she didn't want to engage in conversation with Ms. Amalia any longer. Ms. Amalia. I'm not a doctor. The old woman's eyes shot a few prickly lightning bolts in her direction, but Laura ignored her displeasure and hurried to the store, which was already visible at the end of the street. Excuse me, Ms. Amalia. I truly don't have time. She pursued her with her words. Look at you, so proud. A real farmer, no doubt. But when was the last time you plucked a chicken? I remember, Laura, how you used to run around the village barefoot with the boys. Have you forgotten how you destroyed my shed that time? The village woman didn't stop listing Laura's past mistakes as she made her way to the store. 
Along the way, she recalled all the grievances she had suffered from the Laura's family, with whom Ms. Amalia had sometimes been friends and sometimes enemies. The feisty elderly woman was so caught up in her accusatory speech that she didn't immediately notice Mr. Tim limping in the direction of the store. Mr. Tim used to manage the farm and, after retiring, decided to focus on community activities. He promptly got down to fulfilling his duties. Hey, Amalia. Why are you making such a scene? Shouting like that, scaring people. The old woman put her foot forward. And who are you to demand an explanation from me? Mr. Tim puffed out his chest proudly. As the head of the local settlement, I have the right to know. Ms. Amalia stomped her feet in her huge galoshes. And who elected you, Mr. Tim? Did you appoint yourself the head and now you're making demands? You'd better tell people how you roam around the farm at night. How many sacks of feed have you stolen? Mr. Tim couldn't tolerate such impertinence even from a former love interest. In his later years, he often visited the lonely milkmaid, which was the result of an old injury. Despite his limp, the village head took a defiant stance and even attempted to step towards his opponent. Ms. Amalia. I won't let the fact that you're a woman stop me. I'll teach you a lesson that your galoshes won't save you from. Offended, Ms. Amalia shouted loudly enough for the whole street to hear. Good people. What's going on? The village head is threatening me. At the elderly woman's cries, Vivian, the cashier from the store, rushed out. The mere sight of this ample lady sent shivers through unruly customers. The cashier cast a furious gaze first at Ms. Amalia, then at Mr. Tim, and said assertively. Hey, you old troublemakers. Settle down or I'll have to take serious action. The disputants instantly fell silent, knowing that Vivian didn't just throw words to the wind. Ms. Amalia mumbled something to herself and headed back to her house, while Mr. Tim settled on a bench near the store. Vivian returned to her workstation and answered the questioning looks of a few customers. Yes, Amalia and Mr. Tim clashed again in an uneven battle. They can't get along, always sorting things out. I swear, they're like little children. It's hard to believe that people at their age can have such brawls. Reflectively, Laura said something thoughtful. Vivian. You're absolutely right. They say that old folks revert to childhood, it's a natural phenomenon. A person is born, grows up, reaches the peak of their development, and then the reverse process begins. The cashier pursed her lips. You would know better, Laura. After all, you're the educated one around here. But there's just one thing I can't understand. Why do you stay in this backwater? What's the point of your flower plantation? If I were in your place, I would have moved closer to the capital or even left for abroad by now. You have plenty of money. What keeps you in our village? Laura shrugged and gave a somewhat foolish smile. Vivian, it's strange. But this is the second time today that I've been asked that question. I can't even understand it myself. What's keeping me here? Probably, the land. She paid for her purchases and headed towards the exit, but outside she suddenly remembered that she forgot to buy salt. Vivian looked at the returning customer with understanding. You forgot to buy salt, didn't you? Laura looked at the store employee in surprise. Vivian. Do you have mind-reading abilities? Vivian responded. Dealing with you, Laura, soon I'll start to read thoughts and even cluck like a chicken. I have to practice telepathy and magic. By evening, the drunkards will wake up and line up here. They'll be asking to release them on credit, and I'll have to listen to their hungover ramblings. The women in line began to express sympathy for Vivian, and Laura put a packet of salt into her bag, feeling a sense of duty fulfilled. She headed home. To avoid running into Ms. Amalia again, Laura took a longer route back. Along the way, she pondered Vivian's words. After some contemplation, she came to the conclusion that village life held a special charm. Perhaps, this circumstance acted as an invisible magnet, attracting and holding her heart in place. Purring something to herself, Pamela was bustling around the stove. Laura asked in surprise. Weren't you heading out for a run? Without turning around, Pamela cheerfully replied. 
I changed my mind. You can say your words had an effect on me. I felt so ashamed that I immediately decided to make amends. Just another moment, and our porridge will be ready. Pamela stirred the mixture in the pot with a large spoon. Laura walked into the kitchen. Are you making this diet porridge without salt? Why without? I got the necessary ingredient. Miss Sarah gave it to me. And why did she show up at the end of summer? The tone of Laura's voice quivered, and finally, Pamela was distracted from cooking. However, she forgot about her friend who had lent her salt because she was astonished by her mother's appearance. She clapped her hands. Mom. Did you really parade around the village in that outfit? Well, yes. Is something wrong with me? Absolutely not. It's just a killer look. A dress and style, I wasn't the only one who tumbled around in the fields, and that fashionable hat. By the way, Sarah's father also came. I can imagine his eyes popping out if he saw you dressed like that. Laura scolded her daughter with irritation. Pamela, stop it. Don't criticize your mother. You also roam around the village in such a way that I'm sometimes embarrassed for you. How many times have I asked you not to wear those tattered pants? You have a closet full of clothes. Can't you choose something decent? The girl dashed into the hallway and started twirling in front of the mirror. These are normal pants, and the rips are the trendiest thing. Laura glanced at the wall clock. Pamela, you've been driving me crazy all morning. It's almost 10, and I haven't done anything yet. Let's have breakfast. Sure. Today, I'll be helping with the distribution, and you just sit, Mom. Rest. Maybe in the evening, we can visit the Williams together? The girl deftly portioned the porridge onto plates and sat down across from her mother. From the gleam in her eyes, Laura could tell without a doubt that Pamela was scheming something. The hint about William's visit was not accidental. Pamela had imagined that she had a secret romance with her childhood friend, but their relationship was purely business. Laura started eating the porridge, reminding Pamela. Let's eat. You're driving me crazy since early morning. Sure. Today, I'll be helping with the distribution, and you just sit, Mom. Rest. Maybe in the evening, we can visit the Sarah's family together? The girl deftly portioned the porridge onto plates and sat down across from her mother. From the gleam in her eyes, Laura could tell without a doubt that Pamela was scheming something. The hint about visit was not accidental. Pamela had imagined that she had a secret romance with her childhood friend, but their relationship was purely business. Laura started eating the porridge, reminding Pamela. Daughter, I really don't have time. By the evening, the people should come for the prepared materials, and I haven't even checked the drying racks today. If you still have questions for me, ask them quickly." Pamela gazed at her mother, and in her eyes, Laura saw something she hadn't noticed before. In a gentler tone, she said. Well, my dear, why are you silent? The girl began fiddling with the edge of the tablecloth, a sign of strong emotion. Mom, please don't get upset with me, but I've been wanting to ask you about Dad for a long time. Sarah has such a great father, and I only have you. I was so young back then and hardly remember anything from that other life." Pamela averted her gaze, as if afraid her mother would read what she was trying to hide. Laura calmly said, I don't want to think about that person. He ceased to exist for me. But what about me, Mom? After all, he's my father. Doesn't he want to see me? I can't say that. But judging by the fact that he hasn't called or written once in the past 10 years, he's not interested in your life." Pamela looked into her mother's eyes again. Maybe he just doesn't know where you took me? The woman drew her daughter closer. He knows perfectly well. I even sent him your photograph, but he never responded. That's it. Let's not bring up this topic again. Aren't we happy living together? Laura tried to sound upbeat, but a sense of melancholy crept through her voice. Pamela, I'll be in the drying room, and you clean up the dishes and straighten up the house. Her daughter didn't reply, and the mother understood that she was still under the impression of their conversation about her father. 
However, the woman knew that someday she would have to tell her daughter everything, and that time had come. Old emotional wounds resurfaced, and a thought flashed through her mind. No matter how much you try to push the past away, it will still knock on the door. Until late in the evening, Laura checked the raw materials ready to be sent to the client, and all this time, memories of her failed marriage haunted her. When Laura informed her closest relatives that she was marrying the son of a New York professor, her parents were shocked. But her grandmother and grandfather rejoiced in the news like children. Ms. Gina, contrary to her granddaughter's warning, spread this news throughout the region. Later, Mr. John reproached his wife. What's with this habit of yours to jump ahead? What if the wedding falls through? What will you say then? Although Ms. Gina felt guilty, she decided to argue with her husband. If you stop wagging your tongue, then nothing will happen. You've gotten into the habit of predicting things in advance. I'm just not accustomed to making hasty conclusions. You know that saying, don't count your chickens before they hatch. But you always want to jump ahead. You know what our people are like with gossip. You can't share anything with anyone. Ms. Amalia is a prime example. After her husband's stern reprimand, Ms. Gina closed her mouth, but it was already too late. The whole region knew about the upcoming wedding. When Laura visited the old couple for a day, the local women didn't let her pass. Laura. Tell us, how did you manage to snatch a city groom? There's nothing special about you. What did you do? The materialistic aspect was all that interested the other neighbors. Laura. Is your groom wealthy? The girl didn't answer these questions because she knew that every word of hers would be turned upside down. There was another reason that kept her silent, the fear of the evil eye. Such fears had been instilled in her by her grandmother since childhood. Ms. Gina had worked for many years as a nurse in the clinic and had a good understanding of medicine when the paramedic was absent. She would advise villagers on what to take for various ailments. Additionally, she was knowledgeable about medicinal herbs. Her simple recipes usually had the desired effect. The rumor that she was engaged in clandestine practices reached the paramedic. He was greatly outraged and scolded the woman in front of visitors. Ms. Gina, I won't allow you to practice folk medicine in the institution entrusted to me. I'm obligated to report this flagrant case. But the threats of the medical worker didn't frighten her. Don't intimidate me. I can also file a complaint against you. You don't show up at work for days, and people come seeking help. You should be grateful to me for covering for you. After this defiance from the nurse, the paramedic decided to find a replacement for her, but nobody was willing to take that position. Even the locals declined. For that salary, let him scrub the floors himself. The standoff ended with the paramedic visiting the Zakin family's home and begging his former subordinate. Ms. Gina. Forgive me if I unintentionally offended you. Come back to the clinic, I'm lost without you. The woman didn't agree right away. She decided to tease her offender a bit. She was helping with John's complaints. He scolded his wife. Why are you inflating your value? If someone asks you, go and work. There are things I don't like about my job too, but I endure it. Because I know they can't replace me. Mr. John had worked in the collective farms accounting for over 40 years. His employment record book had only two entries, hired and retired due to well-earned rest. Laura was proud of her elderly relatives and insisted that they attend her wedding. The bride's parents also made an appearance at the celebration, but they left the day after the ceremony. However, the elderly couple stayed for a whole week in the Petersons' home. They quickly found common ground with Mr. George, who organized daily tours of New York for them. Tom's father had praise for his daughter-in-law. Laura, a true wonder. Our apartment became brighter with her arrival. I will try to provide her with work in our institute. Mr. John was satisfied with the compliment from the distinguished relative and added. All the women in our village are like that. They're not afraid of fire and they don't drown in water. The professor promised. As soon as I have some free time, I will definitely come to visit you. They settled on that. Laura was floating on cloud nine, not noticing anything around her. 
However, her grandfather's discerning eye found many faults in the groom. Before leaving, the old man pulled his granddaughter aside. Laura. Your Tom has a wormhole in his soul. The girl burst into laughter. Grandpa. You're just used to measuring everything with village standards, but in the big city, everything is different. The old man countered. People are the same everywhere. And those with decay, I can sense them from a mile away. Your Tom isn't what he pretends to be. Keep an eye on him. To reassure her grandfather, Laura promised to stay vigilant. Of course, she soon forgot about that promise. She also didn't remember her grandfather's concerns because the hustle and bustle of the city life absorbed her. She and Tom were completely dedicated to their common cause. Well, more accurately, Laura toiled day and night over documents and new projects, while her husband kept up with her. Laura, try to finish faster. We don't have time. You know how much money we've invested in this venture. God forbid we fail. We'll be left with nothing. The young woman resigned herself to the fact that she had to handle all the rough work, while Tom took on partner search and legal matters. Even during her pregnancy, Laura worked at the same intense pace. She often complained to her husband. Tom. I won't be able to hold on much longer. Sometimes, I feel like I'll collapse and won't get back up. Her husband would comfort her. Laura, you're strong. Your grandfather boasted about you to my father. I know, Grandpa likes to show off himself and he's not averse to spinning tales about his village. But even a strong woman needs rest. Especially when she's pregnant. Continuous stress could negatively affect our child. Only after this powerful argument did Tom make a slight concession for his wife. But working to the point of exhaustion had taken its toll. The labor began earlier than expected and was very difficult. After the birth of their daughter, Laura fully focused on the child, which caused not only dissatisfaction but also anger in her husband. One day, Laura couldn't hold back and expressed to Tom everything she thought of him. You treat me like a servant. You're just using me, not caring at all about my health. I get the impression that you don't even care about our daughter. The man was infuriated. You should keep your mouth shut and pray. Such a stroke of luck doesn't happen to everyone. You're living it up in the center of New York. Driving around in an expensive car. Dressing in the latest fashion. And you're still not satisfied? So, you're saying that I should be jumping for joy that I'm at your service? Are you saying that I haven't earned anything and I'm worth nothing? Tom burst into laughter in her face. Go look at yourself in the mirror. You might weight 500 kilo. Laura gave her husband a sharp slap. They didn't talk for a whole week, but Tom gave in first. Laura, enough sulking. You angered me, and I was rude to you. But I told you the truth without exaggeration. It's time for you to work on your figure. However, weight loss was not successful for the woman. She didn't have time to visit a fitness club either, as work consumed all her time. Beauty from Peterson of Company was expanding every year, and profits were increasing. They had to hire new employees. Tom personally handled the recruitment, so Laura wasn't aware of the latest developments. But one day, she urgently needed financial documents and went to the main office with her daughter. She was surprised to find an unfamiliar girl sitting at her workstation. At home, she interrogated her husband. Tom, why is this beauty sitting at my computer? Her husband first cleared his throat and then stated. Let's start with the fact that all office equipment is company property. Regarding your second point. I can say that as the head of the company, I have the right to select personnel without consulting my wife in advance. That means with you. And you correctly noted that this girl's name is Martha, and she is indeed very beautiful. I probably don't need to explain to you that clients and our partners assess the company based on the appearance of its employees. And Martha fully meets the strictest requirements. She is worthy of being the face of our company. The young woman's breath caught in her throat from outrage. So, I'm ruining the image? Exactly. I've been asking you for a long time to work on your body. 
this sounded offensive to the young woman. She once again subjected herself to diets. She even consulted a nutrition specialist, who told her. Don't torment yourself in vain. Because you will never attain model standards. You have a wide bone structure from birth. Although your weight is almost normal. Therefore, there's an illusion of plumpness that doesn't actually exist. She returned home in a slightly uplifted mood, but Tom didn't want to hear her out. You're just looking for excuses for your weakness, but I'm not insisting. If you like walking around like a cart, go ahead. Soon, Laura learned that Tom was seeing Martha. It happened by chance when Mr. George stopped by to play with his granddaughter. In the hallway, before leaving, he scolded his son for his affair on the side. Tom, have you completely lost your shame? Why are you exposing your personal life to public scrutiny? You're humiliating Laura with this. Tom rudely interrupted his father and asked him not to interfere in his family matters. The next day, Mr. George ended up in the hospital with a heart attack, but the doctors couldn't save the professor. This was a heavy loss for Laura because her father-in-law had always protected and supported her. However, this wasn't the end of her troubles. Just six months after the tragedy, her husband and the father of her child pointed them to the door. That autumn day was etched into Laura's memory for the rest of her life. Tom didn't even give her time to gather herself. He wanted to speed up the process. At some point, he began to pack her belongings into a suitcase himself. He was completely indifferent to the sobbing of Pamela, who was constantly coughing. Only once did he irritably order his wife. Calm down the child. Why is she crying? She's already big enough. Laura retorted. And have you not noticed that your daughter is sick? She had a fever yesterday, and today she developed a cough. If you want to upset me, you're trying in vain. Yeah, I've long understood that you won't amount to anything. You're a lousy husband, a lousy father, and a lousy head of a company. The ball sent by the woman hit the net. The man spun around like a spinning top and burst into falsetto. Yeah, who are you? Stupid village girl. Get out of here, you fat pig. Five-year-old Pamela got scared and started crying loudly, but Tom shouted at his daughter too. Why are you mooing like a cow? Your mommy will take you away to a place where it's peaceful, and then maybe she'll find you a new daddy, there are plenty of simple country guys. In conclusion to this statement, Tom burst into hysterical laughter, while Laura, along with her daughter, hurried to leave the apartment where her happiness had crumbled like a house of cards. The young woman rushed into the elevator and resolutely pressed the button for the first floor. In the initial moments of feverish panic, she didn't know where to go with her belongings and her sick child. The cold rain mixed with snow generously covered the already frozen ground, and the woman almost slipped several times. In one hand, she dragged a suitcase and a bag, and in the other, she held Pamela. Sweetie, bear with it a little longer. We're going to the train station now, and we'll warm up there. Laura wanted to hail a taxi, but only at the taxi stop did she remember that her wallet was in her purse on the bedside table. She dialed her husband's number, but instead of Tom, a woman answered. Laura. Tom asked me to tell you to stop bothering him. Laura screamed into the phone. Listen, you silicone doll. I'm still the legal wife, and you're just a temporary fling, that's the first thing. And secondly, my purse is left on the nightstand with the wallet inside. Bring it to the bus stop, I'll wait for exactly five minutes, if I don't get my belongings, I'll go to the police. I have nothing to lose, but Peterson might lose a lot. Soon, a breathless Martha rushed to the bus stop. She handed Laura her purse and blurted out for some reason. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It just happened. Laura looked Martha up and down and said. I'm sure the same fate awaits you. Taking what doesn't belong to you has never benefited anyone. The woman hailed a taxi and quickly loaded her luggage into the car's trunk. She picked up her daughter in her arms. Martha stood frozen on the bus stop trembling from the cold and fear. For just a few minutes, Laura thought about where to go. She didn't want to return to her parents in the regional center, as that would require explaining why her family had fallen apart. 
Pamela looked at her mother with anticipation. Are we going by train? The woman smiled. Yes, my girl. We'll buy tickets now and go to Grandma Gina and Grandpa John. Will they scold me? Why would they scold you, my sweet? For coughing. No, Pamela. They're very kind, and Grandma will heal your cough. She knows a lot of helpful herbs. And she won't give me shots, will she? I'm scared of shots. No, my darling. We'll try to manage without radical treatments. This explanation satisfied the girl, and soon she was peacefully dozing off on her mother's lap. During the night, the travelers boarded a train that passed through Belarus. Mr. John had gone outside to get firewood when unexpected guests appeared at the gate. The sudden surprise caused him to drop the firewood from his hands. Laura? Oh my god. Why are you standing there? Gina? We have guests. Come, greet them. But Gina was already standing on the porch, tears of unexpected joy streaming down her face. She embraced her granddaughter for a long time, then little Pamela, and kept repeating tirelessly. How wonderful that we live to see this day. Now we can rest in peace. After the welcoming traditions were observed, Ms. Gina confessed tearfully. Granddaughter, your grandfather and I had bad dreams about you all week. Tell us, what trouble has befallen you? But Laura was so exhausted from the journey and the emotional turmoil that she begged. Grandma. I will definitely tell you everything. But first, Pamela and I need to rest. In the evening, a family council was held at the Zakin Sr.'s house. Laura's parents also came to the village upon hearing about their daughter's arrival with her granddaughter. The young woman cried, reliving the recent events. She told her family in detail how her husband had kicked her out. Mr. John listened to his granddaughter, his eyes cast down, but anger was evident in his flushed cheeks. As soon as Laura fell silent, the old man growled. What a scoundrel! Tomorrow, I'm going to that damn New York to show that bastard where the crayfish hibernate. Ms. Gina launched into lamentation again. We don't need you to end up in jail in your old age. Just stay home, hero. Laura's father supported her mother. Yes, Dad. It's better not to get involved with that scumbag. Trust me, karma will catch up with him. Such deeds don't go unpunished. Especially for a man. Although, Tom, you can hardly call him a man anymore. Especially after what he did. Mr. John declared. And I told you, our son-in-law was rotten to the core. I've never been wrong about people. The old man continued to praise his abilities to read people for a while, and then firmly said. Laura, don't worry. You're not alone, and we'll always help you. Rest, gather your thoughts. Think about what you want to do. Mr. Allen suggested. Daughter, I think the most optimal solution would be to look for a job in the district center. You could find work at a school, teaching biology or botany, and Pamela would enjoy being among other kids. After all, she'll be starting school soon. Laura looked at her family and said. Thank you for your support, but can I decide my own future? Just two days later, Laura surprised her family, saying. I've thought everything through and come to the conclusion that I'll stay here in the village. Mr. Allen asked with surprise. And what will you do here? Business. Her relatives exchanged glances, and her grandpa even chuckled, amused by the overflow of emotions. We already have one businessman here. A retired colonel. He breeds bees. He's driving everyone crazy. Are you also planning to start honey production? No, grandpa. I've chosen a different line of work. I'll grow flowers. I'll lease a piece of land and plant lavender, chamomile, and mint. Mr. John said in a disappointed tone. Now that's a surprise. I thought you had something serious planned. And you're talking about flowers. Can you get rich from that? The expression on the young woman's face changed, and she started talking enthusiastically about a particular plant she felt a special connection to. 
During my studies, I thoroughly explored this business field. It's highly popular in Europe and we also have positive examples here. Mr. Allen shook his head in bewilderment. Laura, I don't believe these fairy tales that growing flowers can lead to fortune. And you're wrong not to believe. Lavender is an undemanding crop, and it thrives in our soil. With proper agricultural techniques, you can achieve a 200% profitability. This statistic didn't impress Mr. Allen, and he stubbornly asserted. I don't believe it. Mr. John hushed his son. Hush. What's with this skepticism? I don't believe, I don't believe. Let the girl give it a try. Maybe she can achieve something worthwhile. Besides, there's plenty of uncultivated land around here. The authorities would be happy that someone's taking up their cultivation. But Mr. Allen wasn't giving in. But to start a business, you need initial capital, and as far as I understand, Tom left you with nothing. Mr. John mumbled. Good thing he let you live. I will help you with the money. We've got some savings for a rainy day. Laura decided to start her own business with a small plot of land. The only unresolved issue was the marketing of her fragrant products, but her childhood friend William helped her with that. Fate brought them together in childhood when their parents took them to the village for vacations. Although William was four years older than Laura, the age difference didn't hinder their friendship. During their youth, William had helped Laura many times, and she always tried to catch up to him. It was William who inspired her to enroll in an agricultural academy. He had also graduated from the same institution with honors and had settled firmly in the capital city. Laura stayed in touch with her friend and knew that he held a high position in the ministry. After some hesitation, she decided to remind her old friend of her existence. William was delighted with Laura's call. Laura. It's so great that you called. At the first convenient opportunity, I'll rush over. So, wait for me. Don't go anywhere. William appeared in the village just three days after the call. Laura. You can't imagine how glad I am. Let's hear about your life in New York. I heard you really took off with your husband. The woman grinned bitterly. I took off and crashed. I don't have a husband or a company now. All my efforts were in vain. You know, William, it hurt so much to realize that someone you trusted endlessly just used you. Laura briefly told about her failed family life and noticed that her friend was looking at her strangely. A suspicion struck her. William. Do you also have problems in your family? The man looked away. Sort of, but I try not to dwell on it. Especially now, I don't want to spoil the mood. Better tell me what you plan to do next. Learning about her friend's plans, William actively supported her. Laura. You're thinking right and you've chosen what's really needed right now. For proactive people like us, this is the best time in our country, and you can get a loan for business development. And as for selling the products, we'll come up with something. You can trust me to solve that issue. Just a week later, William called and informed her that there was an opportunity to enter into an agreement with a well-known cosmetic company. The company highly values its reputation, so partnering with them will open doors for you. But you need to understand that you'll have to undergo a series of laboratory tests. Laura was ready for any challenge. She was delighted that things were finally moving in a positive direction. However, an unexpected beneficiary emerged, a retired colonel and beekeeper. When the lavender plantation blossomed the following year, Mr. David set up his beehives nearby. What's more, he didn't even inform the landowner about it. The cause of the young flower farmer's initial troubles was indeed Mr. David. On that summer morning, Laura had no idea what awaited her and her daughter on the plot of land she cared for like a living being. She and Pamela set out to the plantation early in the morning to assess the blooming activity. But before they reached their destination, they were attacked by bees. Horror froze their minds and bodies, and it was only Pamela's screams that prompted Laura to take the right actions. As calmly as possible, she said to her daughter. Pamela, don't scream and don't wave your arms. Bees don't like that. Mommy, but they buzz so loudly. One bee already stung me. 
Look, I have a big welt on my hand. I got stung too, but it's better to endure. For a few minutes, mother and daughter stood holding hands. In a hushed voice, Laura said. Well, hang on, comrade colonel. I'll make sure your bees find a special place, so you won't just set up your hives wherever you want. Once the bees had calmed down, the enraged flower farmer marched towards the colonel. Mr. David greeted the young woman with delight. Laura. You've really made me happy. You won't believe it, but I was just thinking about you. With undisguised sarcasm, the woman remarked. What a coincidence. I was also thinking about you, and not in the best terms. The colonel raised his thick eyebrows. What's the matter? How have I offended you? Mr. David. I'm not a child to be spoken to like that. You can try to fool my Pamela, but who gave you the right to put your beehives on my land? You could have at least given me a heads up. Instead, you hid them in the bushes, and your aggressive bees stung my daughter and me. A child could have had a reaction to the stings. The woman scolded the man, who shamelessly smiled. Laura, I'm truly sorry that you were hurt. But regarding the land, you're exaggerating. You're just a temporary tenant, not the owner. So your claims are unfounded. You're mistaken, Mr. David. I demand that you immediately remove the beehives. Put them in your own yard and don't forget to keep the windows wide open. The colonel backtracked. Laura. Maybe we can come to an agreement? I'll compensate you for the emotional distress. Just wait a moment. The man disappeared through the door but returned with a chocolate bar and offered it to the woman. Laura was stunned by such audacity. Enjoy your chocolate yourself and make sure your bee boxes are gone today. Otherwise, I'll treat them with copper sulfate. Mr. David lost his temper, as the bees were more valuable to him than anything else. Laura, don't push your luck. I could report you to the local police. I'll be the one reporting you. Tomorrow I'll contact my lawyer, but I won't allow you to act autocratically. Laura was resolute until the evening. However, by the next morning, she was already laughing about the previous day's incident. Meanwhile, David had set the wheels of confrontation in motion, and soon, his son arrived in the village. When the man drove his car onto the property, Laura was working in the garden. She rushed towards him shouting. What are you doing? You're going to ruin all the flowers. The man had imposing dimensions, and even Laura, with her ample build, looked like a helpless chick next to him. He immediately started with threats. Listen, you flower girl. If my dad complains about you again, you'll be pale and wobbly-legged. My apiary will be here. The man turned around and swaggered back to his car. Laura felt a kind of blackout. In a few steps, she caught up to the bully. No. Listen to me, you jerk. If I see beehives on my land again, I'll poison all your bees. And tell your daddy that if he doesn't stop his abuse, he'll deal with my grandpa. Mentioning her grandfather had a much greater effect than the threat to harm the bees. However, that summer, the beehives didn't reappear on Laura's plantation. Instead, rumors spread through the village that the flower farmer had promised to deal with the colonel. Laura accidentally learned about this when she went to the store for groceries. When she entered the local store, everyone immediately fell silent. Even the talkative Vivian stared with wide eyes. Only Ms. Amalia timidly asked. Hey, Laura. Do you really have a gun? Laura stared at the elderly woman, then glanced with astonishment at everyone present. Dear villagers. I rarely carry it with me. I use a different item more often. My grandpa still has it from the war. He keeps it in the attic. It was a shock for the fragile residents of the small village. But the audacious joke turned into another unpleasant situation for the young farmer. The next morning, the local police officer showed up at their house. When it was revealed that the cause of all the confusion was Laura's ill-fated joke, the elderly and the officer laughed for a long time. Yet this story circulated through the region for years, chilling the hearts of the locals. There was another unintended consequence that posed the most harm to Laura's business. 
It didn't fully manifest in the first year, but later, when the farmer expanded her holdings. She started noticing bald patches in her flower field every day. Local freeloaders usually conducted their raids at night. Laura tried to combat this lawlessness, but she couldn't catch the culprits in the act. A solution came from William's daughter, Sarah. At that time, she was already 10 years old and attended an elite school in the capital. The girl often came over to play with Pamela. When she learned about the problem that Laura couldn't solve, she suggested. Why don't you set traps on your land? The farmer didn't understand. Sarah, what kind of traps are you talking about? The girl squinted her eyes cunningly. They're devices to scare people away. There are different types. Some spray water in people's faces like a fountain. Some make noise. For example, someone goes to a secret spot, and a voice comes from under the ground. Or you put my candy in the trap's place. You could even set up a spooky one. Laura acquired deterrent devices with sound signals in the capital when she attended a presentation for a new line of cosmetic products based on lavender oil. When she returned home, she installed the deterrent on her property. She managed to catch the secret intruder on the very first night. Actually, he came to her house himself to express his displeasure. Laura was very surprised to learn that for nearly three years, her property had been ravaged by the village elder. Yet the elderly plunderer of others' property wasn't bothered by the fact that he was engaging in illegal activities. Mr. Tim began expressing his indignation to Laura in an elevated tone. Is it really possible to scare decent people like that? Decent people, Mr. Tim, don't meddle in other people's affairs. Engaging in such unworthy matters at your venerable age is very shameful. The village elder said with offense. Are you really that attached to the flowers? What's the harm in plucking a few for myself? I thought it wouldn't hurt you. As it turned out, the desire for other people's belongings afflicted other villagers as well. Thus, the farmer's plantation was constantly subject to raids in an attempt to solve this problem. Laura suggested to her fellow villagers to buy the flowers they liked from her. She even offered a very reasonable price, but this option didn't satisfy anyone. The village elder sadly remarked. When it's free, it's a different story, but spending money on frivolities? That's not feasible. To rid herself of the marauders, Laura had to hire guards. After expanding her plantation once more, she also employed two women to help her gather and dry the raw materials. With each passing year, her profit grew, and the farmer woman acquired her own vehicle. She renovated the old barns and even had water and sewage installed in her house. The elderly folks were delighted. Thank you, granddaughter. At least we'll live comfortably before we die. Laura replied with a laugh. You're planning to die too soon. It's time to enjoy life. The grandmother was the first to pass away. Ms. Gina didn't suffer from illness and hadn't complained about her health. She simply fell asleep and didn't wake up. Mr. John outlived his wife by only two months. He suffered a stroke while chopping wood in the yard. The entire village attended the old man's funeral. Even the representative from the local council came to say kind words about a person who had faithfully served his land. William, as usual, showed up unannounced. Laura was always happy to see her old friend, so she immediately invited him into the kitchen. Have you had lunch or have you been making do without? The man sighed. You can't hide anything from women like you. You see everything. It's a pity not everyone is as attentive and caring as you are. I'm not one to complain, but lately, I've been using catering services more often. Laura sat down at the table, leaning on her arms. I thought that life doesn't go smoothly for ministry employees. I apologize for the tautology. No, you're right. You're saying everything correctly, and the roller coaster perfectly describes my crisis state. All right. Eat up first. You can tell me later. Will you have the first course? William asked in a childlike manner. What do you have for the first course? Borscht with homemade stewed meat, and for the main course, potato pancakes with sour cream. Two hungry sparks lit up in the man's eyes. Let's have both. 
Laura, you can't imagine how much I've missed simple homemade food. It was evident in the appetite with which William cleared his plates. Laura, you've saved me from a hungry death. Well, of course, I could have had dinner at my old folks' place, but I doubt I would have made it there alive. It's really great to have a reliable friend willing to share a piece of bread. The woman continued to gaze at him attentively. William. And you've got kittens scratching at your heart. I can see it in your eyes. You're observant. Well, you've always been that way. If you want, tell me. It might make you feel better. In principle, I came to you for a completely different reason, but to put it shortly, I'm facing some huge problems in my family. You could even call it a catastrophe. Although, on the other hand, it's a common thing. My wife left me. She found someone else. The man locked his hands together to manage his emotions. No, I phrased it wrong. Our life didn't go well from the beginning, and Brenda said I didn't meet her expectations. Laura was taken aback. My goodness. I never thought that high-ranking officials could have such problems. Ministers are humans too. They get married and divorced, just like ordinary citizens. My wife and I divorced five years ago. After I caught her with a very influential guy, we decided not to publicize our relationship and gradually moved into different apartments. Our daughter stayed with me. Even my wife wasn't against such a division of responsibilities. But now, all of a sudden, her maternal instincts woke up, and she wants to take Sarah away from me through the court. But if I'm not mistaken, your girl is already 13. She'll be 14 soon. She doesn't want to move in with her mother because there's already another man living there, and honestly, hand on heart, we've gotten so used to living just the two of us. No one's bothering you, no one's asking for anything. William, it seems to me you're worrying needlessly. If your daughter wants to stay with her father, no one can force her to live with her mother. You're absolutely right. But trying to reason with my wife is futile. She's as stubborn as a mule. Long story short, she's pestering us, me and Sarah. She's pursuing us. She even tried to forcibly take our daughter away. That's why I brought her here. The man looked at her pleadingly. Laura, could you, out of our old friendship, look after my child? I won't forget this favor. William, don't talk nonsense. Of course, I'll help you, and the girls will have more fun together. But what about school? I drive my own star to that area every day. We don't have elite schools here. Yes, I know. Believe me, now is not the time for pretenses. We need to weather this crisis. Brenda and her husband are planning to move to Germany permanently, and she's persuading our daughter. I can already imagine how tough it'll be for her in a foreign country. William, I told you, I agree. You don't need to persuade me. William left, and the next day, Sarah moved in with them. Laura thought the girl would be living with her relatives. However, the friends decided to unite under one roof. Pamela, with a conspiratorial look, pulled her mother aside. Mom, are you angry that we did this without asking? The woman sighed. Will it change anything if I am? Her daughter twirled around her like a whirlwind. Mom, Sarah, and I will help you. I promise. We've already decided that we'll take care of cleaning, and Sarah knows how to cook. If you allow us, we can gather and dry flowers too. Laura playfully waved a towel at her daughter. Get out of here, little flatterer. To her surprise, Laura quickly realized that Sarah's presence had a positive impact on her daughter. A competitive spirit even emerged in their relationship. They eagerly tackled any task, each trying to outdo the other. More and more often, the woman began to think that it wouldn't be bad to have two daughters, but she had long forbidden herself to dream of personal happiness. And when William visited them, the woman acted deliberately stern. Pamela once commented on this. Mom, it's funny to watch you. You're trying to play the ice queen, but you're not doing well at it. If I were you, I'd focus on Sarah's dad. You'd be fine, and Sarah and I would move to the capital. The mother was indignant. Have you already planned everything without my consent? 
and I don't want to go anywhere. Mom, you can leave your plantation to someone else. That's what all real businessmen do. And why don't you want, for example, to become the owner of a cosmetic salon or something else worthwhile? Laura just shrugged, as she wasn't ready to answer her daughter's question. Spring arrived, and the farmer woman eagerly started her favorite work. Through a former classmate, she obtained seeds of an elite lavender variety, and for experimentation, she decided to plant several varieties of flowering plants. Right in the midst of her work, Pamela came running to the plantation. Mom, drop everything. Uncle William has come. He's demanding to see you urgently. In the field, the woman always rode her bicycle. She quickly hopped onto the two-wheeled transport and headed to the village. William was impatiently pacing around the yard. When he saw Laura, he was delighted. You can't imagine the news I bring you. William, just remember that I can't always process news appropriately. So, it's better to be cautious and keep your distance. Fine, let it be as you say. You've told me that you have experience working in a big company. Well, yes. My husband had a cosmetic company in New York. That's why you have a unique opportunity to become the sole owner of a similar enterprise. I've been informed that in a couple of days, there will be an auction, and a bankrupt company will be sold off. I think you should show interest. It's high time for you, Laura, to step beyond the boundaries of your plantation. Any endeavor requires development, and you've been stuck on one step. Throughout the night, Laura tossed and turned. She had long dreamt of becoming the owner of something big and promising, but she was afraid. And now, such a fortunate turn of events. Unable to wait for morning, she dialed William's number. William, I'm sorry. I decided to bother you in the middle of the night. I want to thank you and let you know that I'm willing to give it a try, but going to New York alone somehow scares me. Maybe you could accompany me? Laura, I can't promise that off the top of my head. You understand, I'm a government employee, but I'll try to fulfill your request. Expect a final answer tomorrow. For some reason, Laura was sure that William would manage to get a day off, and she wasn't mistaken. The next day, her friend called himself. Get ready. I'll pick you up tomorrow at 6 a.m. We'll go in my car. It's faster and safer that way. Throughout the journey, they chatted about trivial matters, and only towards the end of the road did Laura ask. William. Do you happen to know the name of the company being auctioned off? You know, I didn't pay attention. There will be several options at the auction, so I didn't really focus on the name, but it's something related to beauty. Well, that's understandable. After all, women use cosmetics to enchant us men with their beauty. This answer satisfied the woman, and she didn't ask any more questions of that kind. Laura observed William discreetly from beneath half-closed eyelids. He looked nothing like a ministry worker now. He was dressed in jeans and a light t-shirt. Yes, his clothes were expensive, and that was evident, but expensive attire didn't surprise anyone anymore. Laura chuckled to herself. If the villagers knew how much money she had and how much she was willing to invest in an unknown company, half of them would probably faint, and the other half would rush to start cultivating flowers in their gardens too. Laura couldn't take her eyes off William's hands. He was turning the steering wheel, and the muscles beneath his shirt were flexing rhythmically. She even felt a bit annoyed. Was she yearning for the warmth of a man? As if she needed that. There would be no more men in her life. They only brought problems. William, of course, wasn't like that. Let him remain a good, caring friend. He unexpectedly turned towards her. Laura. What are you mumbling over there? Laura snapped out of her thoughts and immediately became flustered. Who, me? He laughed. No, it's like I'm the one. You know, today while I was driving behind you, I somehow remembered how you stirred up your village. Remember? I had to lie and say you were at my place, and we were reading books. Laura burst into laughter. Well, you're something else. I hadn't thought about that for so many years that I had almost forgotten it, and here you are bringing it up. The incident happened so long ago that Laura had almost forgotten about it. 
It all revolved around Ms. Amalia, with whom she still had clashes. Ms. Amalia always had a very unpleasant character, and her cat at the time, had the same temperament. This cat kept all the village cats in fear and longed at people as fiercely as a guard dog. One day, when Laura's cat, or rather her grandparents' cat, came back with battle scars again, Laura got angry. You wretch. I'll make you the kindest creature. You'll love everyone, and most importantly, sing songs to Ms. Amalia a day and night. Even then, Laura had a strong interest in studying the properties of various herbs. Of course, William, though older, couldn't refuse to support her. They both didn't think that the effect would turn out this way. For two days, Laura prepared the potion. William only asked. Will this send the cat to the other side? No, don't worry. I won't harm him in any way. It's, well, how can I explain it to you? It's like moonshine for our villagers. You always want more, it's never enough, but then it's fun, and even the grass seems to grow faster. As soon as it got dark, and it got dark closer to midnight. Summer nights are short. Laura and William quietly set out on their mission. William stood guard, while Laura generously smeared Ms. Amelia's gate with the liquid she had prepared, and they immediately went back to their homes. In the morning, Laura was awakened by frantic cries. She jumped out of bed and pressed herself to the window. The girl's eyes grew wide. Around Ms. Amelia's gate, a large circle of cats were walking and crying out. Or rather, if you put it in their language, the cats were singing. The sight was strange and quite terrifying. About 40 cats were walking in a single trajectory, singing. And they sang in a way that gave you goosebumps. A crowd of villagers stood nearby. People watched this scene with horror and quietly discussed when the end of the world was coming. From time to time, one of the housewives would rush forward, grab her cat to take it home, but at that moment, the cat would turn into a real fury, break free, and head back to the gate. Ms. Amalia fell down at that point. Because she was convinced that someone had cursed her, and most likely it was Gina, because she was capable of it. However, during the day, Grandma approached Laura and William. Laura. Confess. Was it your doing? Laura was ready to admit everything, but William said. Yes, you see, Granny Gina. We were up late studying books, and then Laura went to sleep. Yes, you saw it yourself. It was the only time Laura had deceived her grandma. The room where the property matter was being resolved in a legal manner wasn't crowded. Laura and her companion were trying to find empty seats when someone called her. Laura. What are you doing here? She turned abruptly and paled. Standing before her was her ex-husband, but in this man, there was nothing left of the self-assured and arrogant egoist who had nearly wrecked her life. William observed the encounter between the former spouses and didn't know how to get out of this awkward situation. To ease the tension, he reminded them that it was time to take their seats, but Tom couldn't move from his spot. Laura. You can be happy now. I'm completely bankrupt. Today, in this hall, a historic event will take place. They will sell my company, to which I dedicated half of my life, for a pittance. The man was speaking with desperation and loudly, attracting the attention of those present. Laura felt out of her element. Above all, she wanted to run away from here, but William was holding her hand tightly. Do you want me to show sympathy now? You know, I don't have any. Really? Well, of course. You would have liked to get a piece of the pie too, but it didn't work out. Laura suddenly realized how pitiful Tom looked, as if he wanted to take a last bite, grabbing as much attention as possible. Tom. Everything I need in life, I have. He looked at her with interest and only now noticed that his ex-wife actually looked quite good. If there was one thing he could distinguish, it was cheap clothes from good expensive ones. And her hair was styled and cut neatly. Did they open a hair salon in that remote village? Tom shifted his gaze to her companion. There was something familiar about him. He had seen him somewhere before, but now he wasn't interesting to Tom. Are you trying to say you're living wonderfully? But... Laura picked up his words. But how is that possible? 
If you threw me out onto the street? Is that what you wanted to ask? Tom was taken aback. He hadn't expected Laura to speak so loudly and directly about it. Why are you like this? Circumstances just unfolded that way. Suddenly, Tom thought that if he were honest with himself, Laura's contribution to their company had been enormous. And the next thought made him sweat. Laura had loved him so much. What if he quickly made a move? Swapping Martha for Laura now? She would solve things, just like a true chess player. In any case, she would come up with something. These thoughts consumed Tom so much that he even missed the moment when he was called into the courtroom. He went, took his seat, and suddenly saw Martha in the room. He frowned. Why did she come here? And almost immediately, he heard that Martha had filed for divorce and, as she had worked in the company for many years, she was demanding financial compensation as his wife. The phrasing was something like that. She claimed to have worked for the benefit of the company, while Tom had ruined everything with his unsuccessful actions, and she and their son suffered as a result. It sounded like complete nonsense to Tom. Yes, it was nonsense for him, but the discussion was taking place in all seriousness. He tried to scorch his wife with his gaze, but she didn't even look at him. So what does this mean? Even if he manages to salvage something from the sale of the company, if anything remains after the debts are paid off, she will get her hands on it? Tom shifted his gaze to Laura. What an imbecile he was. He hadn't even asked her what she was doing here. He started complaining about his misfortunes, just like a woman. Well, of course, she probably applied for some sort of compensation. After all, she had a daughter with him. This was a mess. Well, nothing. He would fight for every penny. A woman in a strict suit droned on for a long time, reciting his debts. Tom scowled in anger. He noticed that Laura was taking notes and discussing something with that same companion. It was still interesting, why was she here? Why were they rewriting his debts? There were two ways to resolve the problem. The company could be completely liquidated. All equipment, raw materials, and finished products would be sold, and the proceeds would go towards paying off the debts. Alternatively, the company could be sold as a whole, with the obligation to pay off all debts. Tom was convinced that they would choose the first option. Then, there would be enough not only to cover the debts but also to have a bit left for himself. By the way, it was Laura who had insisted on buying high-quality, expensive equipment back in the day. She said that only with such equipment could they produce quality products. Even now, that equipment was worth a considerable amount of money. When Laura raised her hand, Tom looked at her with interest. Now everything would become clear. What he heard left him in a state of shock. She was planning to buy his company. Yes, even paying off all the debts at once? No, this just couldn't be true. It was some kind of nonsense. Where did she get the money from? He even stood up in agitation. He saw the way Martha was looking at him. Damn that Martha. After the hearing, Tom caught up with Laura. I see you've settled in quite nicely. He shot a quick glance at William. Have you really found people who even keep cows? William turned around in an instant and delivered a solid punch to Tom's nose. Then, he took Laura by the arm and they walked out. Martha approached Tom. Did you see that? Did you see that? You'll testify in court. Of course, I will. I saw perfectly well how you clung to the chair. Martha walked away, not bothering to help him up. Tom got up on his own and hurriedly left, under the watchful eyes of those present. Pamela opened the gate and froze. Oh. And when did you manage to return, and why does it smell so delicious here? Sarah's head appeared behind her. If I'm not mistaken, it's our father's signature barbecue, and he only makes it on special occasions. William laughed. You two are like pedigreed shepherds. You caught the scent and followed it. The girls entered the yard, and the gazebo was almost set for a meal. They didn't understand anything at all. Laura appeared from the house. Oh, the gluttons have arrived. Come quickly to help me. 
The girls headed into the house, still not comprehending what was happening. Mom. Could you explain to us what this grand event is? Sarah slapped her forehead. I think I know. Pamela suspiciously looked at her. Spill it. Listen, but it does seem to add up. They went to the city, then returned and set the table. They probably filed an application. Pamela gave her mother a scrutinizing look. Mom. Did we guess right? Laura blushed. Well, of course not. What nonsense is getting into your heads? Take the plates and head outside. The girls burst out laughing as they rushed out, still not understanding a thing. Ladies. Enough chatting. Everyone to the table quickly. Meat can't wait, it needs to be eaten while it's hot. Everyone sat down in the gazebo, laughing, and Laura raised her glass. Well, what? Now I can speak. The toast will be short, and later, Pamela, if you want to hear the details, I'll answer all your questions. Today, I bought back the company that I once founded. Indeed, then Tom, my ex-husband, decided that the company should belong only to him. The company is in terrible shape. It's almost bankrupt. But it has its brand, which has been shaken but not lost, and there's equipment and production. I want to raise a glass to its future prosperity. Pamela and Sarah, with their mouths open, listened to what Laura was saying. They mechanically drank their juice, and finally, Pamela exhaled. Mom. Is that true? It's true, my dear. But it's also true that we'll now have to go back and forth, and honestly, I'm not quite sure how I'll manage it all. Pamela stared at her mother with wide eyes. And what's the name of the company? Quite grand-sounding, actually, Beauty by Peterson. But I think we'll rename it. We don't need someone else's laurels, even if they're no longer there. Pamela was in a state of some stress. She hardly spoke, and when the guests left, and they cleaned up all the dishes with her mother, she sat down in front of her. Mom. I think now I'm mature enough to learn everything that happened between you and dad. Laura sighed, sat down opposite her, and said. You're probably right. I'll tell you everything now. Just don't think that I want to intentionally tarnish your father's image. Whatever he may be, he's your father. I always wanted you to communicate with him. But, alas. Tom hadn't slept all night. He was thinking constantly. His mind was always an adventurer's, but now he needed to be very clever to avoid mistakes. In the evening, he gathered information about his ex-wife and scolded himself for not doing it earlier. Turns out, while he thought she was some lowly milkmaid just scraping by, Laura was actually living quite well. Not just well, you could say she was doing splendidly. True, she didn't flaunt it much. But he was told that she was doing quite well financially. Now, of course, it would be very difficult to turn the situation around, to ingratiate himself again. Because she would immediately think he was after her money. But there was one very good idea. This idea involved Pamela. Out of everything, Tom was sure he could melt his daughter's heart. Clearly, the girl hadn't felt very close to him, and Laura had never been the type to turn the child against him. It seemed like a good starting point. He wished he could remember how old she was, or better yet, find out what she was interested in. Well, where there's a will, there's a way. He would come up with something. As soon as morning arrived, Tom left the house. Pamela woke up and stretched sweetly. Oh, how nice it is. They had talked to mom about it yesterday. Pamela realized that Laura hadn't intended to vilify her father, but that's what he turned out to be. Honestly, Pamela wanted to see him, talk to him. She wondered if he felt anything towards her as a daughter or not. Somehow, Pamela felt that he didn't. But to be sure and put the final punctuation mark in this story, she wanted to find out. Pamela. Pamela. Are you still sleeping or what? Sarah's head popped in through the window. Sleeping. Wait, what's happening? No way. Come on, seriously? We're going fishing with Clark today, remember? You were dying to go yourself. 
Pamela jumped out of bed suddenly. With Clark. How could she forget that? Yes, Clark was the hottest guy in school, all the girls were after him, and he invited them fishing. Now she just needed to figure out who he was more interested in, her or Sarah. Pamela made up her mind firmly. If it's Sarah, she'll step back immediately, won't interfere with her friend. Sarah had the same idea. Although, if she really didn't like Clark. He was just too good-looking, almost unreal. And he invited them fishing as if he was doing them a favor. Pamela was ecstatic. So that meant Sarah agreed as well. Ten minutes later, they were by the river. Darn, I forgot to leave a note for my mom. Sarah looked at Clark. We won't be gone for long, right? He nodded in agreement. Surprisingly, when Clark started talking and wasn't just sitting there with that strange look he usually had in school, he turned out to be a very cheerful and straightforward guy. Pamela and Sarah had long forgotten about fishing, they laughed so hard their sides hurt, and Clark kept coming up with new stories. It's time for us to go. It was really fun. Clark looked at them regretfully. How about we hang out by the river in the evening? Pamela smiled. Sure, let's do that. Sarah was about to refuse, but Pamela looked at her in a way that left her no choice but to agree. Pamela. The girls and Clark turned around. A man was standing nearby, looking at Pamela with a somewhat affectionate expression. You? She was a bit taken aback, she'd never seen him before. Then things started to clear up in her mind. Are you Tom? No, that's not right. You got it wrong. I'm your dad. Clark and Sarah looked at Pamela in astonishment, and she immediately calmed down. No. You're mistaken. Dads usually spend time with their kids, and I don't recall you being around me. Tom stumbled a bit in his prepared speech and decided to get to the main point. Pamela. We will definitely talk about everything. Maybe your mom gave you the wrong information? I just couldn't be around for reasons beyond my control. Look at what I brought you. Tom quickly walked to his car and pulled out a laptop. He hesitated to spend the money, but he needed to impress Pamela. He perfectly understood that a girl from the countryside, even if well off, wouldn't have something like this. Honestly, he was expecting to see a complete country bumpkin, but there was a quite fashionable and beautiful girl in front of him. Thank you very much. But I already have a laptop that's much more powerful than this. Tom gritted his teeth. Darn it. You could have kept that to yourself. Pamela remained silent. Tom was silent too. It seemed like things wouldn't be as easy as he thought. Finally, he managed to squeeze out. How have you been, sweetheart? Pamela sighed. It looked like she would have to go through this trial until the end. Fine, let's do this. Clark, Sarah, see you later. They nodded in agreement. Of course, she needed to talk to her dad, whom she hadn't seen for so many years. Tom left his car by the river and he and Pamela started walking towards the houses. As luck would have it, they immediately bumped into Ms. Amalia. She stopped, observed them attentively, and thought for a while about who the man was, she had seen him before. Finally, she remembered. Ms. Amalia picked up her pace and headed in the direction of Laura's fields. Clearly, she knew nothing about what was going on. Laura. Laura tore herself away from her papers. Her mind was currently occupied with figuring out how to make everything stretch, ensuring there was enough for the clients and still left over for her company. It would be highly profitable. Seeing Ms. Amalia, she frowned and went to meet her. What's happened? You're sitting here in your herbs, while Pamela's daddy arrived over there. He's already taken her somewhere, he'll take the girl away, and you won't even know it. Laura's heart nearly stopped. She knew well how beautifully Tom could sing. His speeches could easily throw anyone off balance. Are you sure, Ms. Amalia? Didn't you mix up something? No, I haven't. My memory hasn't failed me yet. Laura didn't say another word. She hopped onto her bicycle and raced into the village. 
she burst into the house like a fury, ready to tear Tom apart right then and there. Pamela was lying on her bed, reading a book. Laura took a deep breath. And where is he? Daddy, you mean? Well, I sent him home, he seemed to have this strange idea that we'd be thrilled to have him back. Mom, what's wrong with you? Why do you look so pale? Laura waved her hand and suddenly burst into tears. Pamela immediately jumped up and hugged her. What were you thinking? Did you think I'd accept him? No, mommy, you're the best for me, and remember, he didn't just drive you away back then, he drove me away too. Laura stood in the middle of the hallway, with Pamela by her side. Look, my dear, I used to come up with everything here. Pamela looked around with admiration. Mom, when I finish my studies, I'll come work for you. Will you take me? Laura laughed. Of course. Currently, the company was empty. All the employees were sent on vacation for an unspecified amount of time. Hey, do you want me to give you a job right now? Of course, I want it. What kind of job? Let's find all the employee phone numbers, and you can start calling them, inviting them to a meeting. For example, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pamela even clapped her hands in excitement. Oh, that's so cool. Like your real assistant. Exactly. Someone cleared their throat behind them. Laura turned sharply. You? Two people entered the room and stopped. It was Martha and her son Kevin. Hello? I was passing by and saw the door was ajar. Figured you were here. Martha looked tired, and in fact, she was. For two weeks now, she had been unsuccessful in finding a job. No one wanted to hire someone who had squandered their own big company. I'm sorry, Laura. I understand I might be saying something foolish right now, but would there be any work for me in your company? You see, in general, everything happened just as you once said. Laura, who was ready to kick this woman out just a minute ago, sighed. Oh, we're all fools, aren't we? Pamela approached Kevin. Hi. He looked at her with clear eyes. Hi. So, you're my brother, I guess? He nodded. Seems like it. Well, what are you waiting for, like a stepbrother? Come on, let's hug. At that moment, Laura had to fight back tears. No matter how impulsive Pamela was, she was genuine, and she had a heart too. Three months later. Well, my dear ones. We've secured a very significant and profitable contract. Well, actually several of them, but the work will be in the same direction. You can congratulate us. Besides your salary, I promise to give out a nice bonus for the new year. The room filled with approving murmurs, many returned to work. Everyone who once knew Laura, without hesitation. Those who were younger, after interviewing with her. There were those who had already found other jobs, but they were slowly joining as well. Next to her sat Martha. They used to work together in a way, and now Martha was helping her a lot. After all these years, the market had changed significantly, and today they could truly celebrate victory. Now Laura could confidently say they were moving up. Pamela often visited her mother's workplace. She frequently stayed with her late into the night, learning and studying everything her mother did. Today, at the meeting, she sat in the front row. They walked outside and got into the car. Well, heading home. Pamela nodded in agreement. A little over a month ago, she and her mother had purchased a very successful apartment. Mom, have you talked to William a long time ago? Yes, a long time ago. I wonder why he hasn't called. Well, Laura wasn't going to tell her that almost every evening she'd grab her phone to call him, only to put it down again, afraid of invading his personal space. If he wasn't calling himself, then there was no need. Mom, that's not right at all. You know how William feels about you. Laura looked at her daughter with a smile. How she had grown. I don't know. Come on, a mom. You understand everything. Me. Laura smiled sadly. Understand what, Pamela? 
If I were interesting to him, he would have at least called. Well, mom, you're leading yourself astray. Why? It's simple. You don't need his help right now. Everything is good for you. So he stepped back not to interfere. Laura suddenly hit the brakes. Do you really think so? I'm sure. Think about it yourself. And what's there to think about? Laura now realized that William had always been there when she needed his help. He would drop everything and rush to her, but now that everything was going well for her, she hadn't even called him herself. I should call him. Pamela caught her mother's hand, which was reaching for the phone. No. I have a better idea. Today is William's birthday. Yes, Sarah told me. But he'll be back from work in about two hours. Of course, he's not planning to celebrate his birthday. Laura smiled. Pamela, where did you get so smart? Call Sarah, and we'll go to the shopping center. Pamela laughed. Now I recognize you, finally something is making you happy lately. Laura smiled. And indeed, even the company's success didn't make her as happy as the upcoming meeting with William. William parked the car. I should have bought a cake at least. Sarah must have prepared some gift. He looked at his watch. The nearest supermarket that was still open was a few blocks away. Fine. His daughter was grown up, she wouldn't mind. He locked the car and headed to the house. He opened the door. Strange. It's so quiet, and my daughter isn't here to greet me. He walked through the large room and turned on the lights.